Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop in our ongoing series on furniture making for beginners. We are going to cover making a picture frame. Very simple, but we're going to make extremely precise miters and we're going to, I'm going to show you how to put them together so they stay together forever. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell, which will alert you whenever we release a new video. Anytime we use a new tool or technique, we'll leave a description down below so that make it easier for you to find. All right, let's get back to work. Nice thing about being able to make a picture frame, you can use it for a picture, you can use it for a mirror. I happen to have a, this a picture of a box that I made to get used in somebody else's catalog, so I thought, why not? put it on the frame. You can use whatever wood you want. I'm going to start with pine. Why? Well, it's very easy to cut. It's very easy to plane. Um, I happen to like it. I think it's a great wood. It ages beautifully. You can use, as I mentioned, any hardwood or softwood that you want. I'm keeping everything very simple. Very square edges, just break the corner so they're not uh, sharp on your hands. Uh, I'm keeping it thin, relatively thin. It's half inch thick. And you, I mean, your choice on how you size it in terms of how wide it is, I like the way the proportions turned out on this. But the most important part is getting these miters so that they're perfectly tight, no gaps. And then of course you want them to stay that way for as long as possible. So coming up with a joint that's going to support that is critical as well. There's lots of options. I'm gonna show you a through spline. I'll show you how to do it. Uh, we're gonna start off, as I mentioned, with Northern White Pine. Okay, I'm gonna frame this picture, which happens to be a prop that I did for that catalog. Now, we need, I'm, I'm, I've already had the lumber milled, and I've taken it down to a half an inch, actually it's a little strong than half an inch, four pieces together, two and strong sixteenth, that'll allow me to plane them, clean them up. Just kind of take a look at it and see. Somebody's already graded this for me, so that looks to be pretty, uh, I shouldn't say plain, but those pieces all kind of go together. So we've got to cut the miters, and we can cut the miters with anything. Cut them with a bandsaw, cut them with a tato saw, cut them with a handsaw, because we're going to come in and we're going to clean them up on a miter shooting board. That's where we get the real precise joint. But the first thing I want to do is I want to clean up the inside face so we can plane off those uh, mill marks and uh, use that, or do that with my shooting board. So, I'm gonna count how many strokes. I do the same amount on all pieces with three. Sometimes you can tell which is the best way to plane just by feeling it. Now we've gotta cut a rabbit or a rebate to hold both the glass and the pitcher and the backing. And the decision is do we cut it now or do we wait <clears throat> until after we've cut the miters? Okay, I think we will cut the rabbit before we cut the miters. Makes it a lot easier to use your uh, push block so that you can keep pressure right over the blade so you, your cut is, ends up being the exact depth that you want. If you've got a miter on there, it's just hard to hold the, the uh, push stick on it. Got the blade set to cut approximately a quarter of an inch deep. Got the fence set so that we're gonna cut a quarter of an inch in from the end. So I'm gonna put that face that I just planed against the fence. We'll make our cut right here. It'll be a quarter of an inch to the outside edge of the kerf. And I'm gonna have the inside facing down. This is the show face. Okay, <clears throat> the fence is set so that we are left with a 3 16th inch piece. That'll be on, that'll, our glass will go in here. And we're, the depth is such that it's gonna give us a nice clean corner. I'm using a rip blade which leaves nice square corners as opposed to those little rabbit ears that you would get on either a cross cut or a combination blade. And I'm cutting it in such a way that the waste will fall to the outside so we don't have anything that's trapped 
between the blade and the fence. Now I already determined how big these pieces are, but let me show you how I came up with it. I want to be able to, I'm going to cut off the white trim on the outside. So we're going to have a pitcher that is 10 inches. I'm using the one just because it's easier than trying to read tab. 10 inches by 17. I'm sorry, 16. 10 inches by 16. So. 10 inches by 16 on the inside, and we're going to miter, means we have to add the width of two pieces. So if you took that 10 inches and put it in here, add the thickness of the two pieces, that's going to be your length. So the length of that piece is going to be 14 and a half. So I've already cut these to just a strong 14 and a half. The nice thing about this is when I, when I start cutting my miters, Instead of trying to find a measurement, I can just use that outside corner. And I'll trim this to perfection on the shooting board. I'm going to take you over to the table saw and show you my setup for cutting miters. And then we'll do a couple by hand to show you that option as well. So I've got a sliding table. Two runners that fit snugly into the, uh, into the uh, miter gauge slots. Even though I'm using a, common, uh, yeah, a rip blade, it'll still give me a clean cut. This is 45. Or this is 90 degrees, sorry. It's made out of one inch MDF. I've got lots of support on the inside, which also helps to shelter the blade somewhat. And I've got sticky back sandpaper on here that just keeps it from moving because anytime you're cutting a miter, there's it always seems to want it to creep a little bit. So what I'll do, I'm gonna cut this so that my, uh, my rabbit is on the inside. And that's always subject to a little bit of tear, so I'm gonna go slow. So, uh, my blade is cutting right on that slot, which is a nice thing about having new sleds, is uh, your, your slot hasn't become extremely wide from just vibration and run out on the blade over years. So when I set this up, I'll simply put it so that the corner is right on that, right on that uh, edge of the slot, and I'll go ahead and make that pass. Now, I've got my blade up fairly high so that uh, it's just more of the force is pushing down instead of pushing up if your blade isn't high enough. If you're not careful, it'll often blow this little piece off, so I go really slow right at the end. This is my bench hook, and what I'll do is use my combination square and a sharp pen or pencil. This is the inside, so I'll just go in there and mark that, using that outside corner as a reference. I'm using a, uh, a crosscut saw. I'll set that in there. Carefully don't cut your bench. Mark this on the wrong side, so I gotta go and do it again. I don't have a 45 on the other direction.
Okay, so there are the 45s that are cut, and you might think that would be good enough. And even though it does provide you with a pretty good, a pretty good miter, we can go and make it even better by cleaning that surface up with a sharp hand plane and a precise shooting board. So that'll be our next step. Okay, so I've got my miter shooting board, and I like to put a clamp on it, just one less thing to move on me. And when you're doing this, obviously your plane has to be really sharp. You're cutting through the end grain of whatever wood it is. Um, you also want to make sure that you keep your plane standing plumb, so don't bear on one side more than the other. I always keep my hand right here over the widest part. You also want to make sure, and this is probably the most critical, is that you keep your plane tight to the fence. If you allow that to push away, you're going to lose, in this case, that 45 degree setup. And the plane is wanting to veer off in that direction, particularly with this cut. So I've got to keep the wood fed into the plane. I've got to keep it laying flat. Do all that at the same time. Now I want that to be a nice clean surface. And I'll just show you what the difference is between the hand plane and coming off the table saw. Hopefully the camera can show that. So I've done the other edge. I've done both edges on this one. So what I'm going to do, I've already planed this one. I'm going to lay one on top of the other, referencing off of the bottom. And you can feel better than a thousandth of an inch with your fingers. So when these two are flush, I'll hold it like that. I keep a plane blade with a flat back, meaning no, no back bevel. And I'm just going to come on here and lay it against that finished surface and leave a mark on the second one. Now it's really faint, but when you use a knife mark like that, you'll notice that as you start to get close to the line, these little fibers are going to break out and helps you identify when you're almost there. Now they're just starting to break out, and I think one more pass should do it. And what you, what you see, if your camera was able to pick up on this, first you get little crumbly missing spots. And then when it's come nice and clean, it's, this lays perfectly tight against the sole of the plane. I've taken some, or made some quarter by quarter sticks. I'll show you how I'm going to use that. And I also want to show you the uh, miter clamps that I made because they make this job a whole lot easier. Now, in fact, we'll leave a link on how we built these. But I made these ones in, uh, specifically for this job so that I didn't have to have eight. I could get away with four. So there'll be one on each piece. I want them the same distance from the ends. And that looks to be about right. But I've got to clamp it this way. Well, this is pine, so it's, you can't clamp on that little narrow edge without damaging it. So by putting this piece of material right there, that'll just give me a little more clamping surface. I'm going to use these clamps just because they're medium duty and they don't They've also got nice pads on them. And I'm, what I'm doing right now, and I'm going to do this up dry first, is to make sure that all of our miters fit perfectly. And we may have to go in and modify the last one. Okay, so... That looks like a lot, but it's a very small amount on each of those. We could actually go in and just, if we went in and just took a little bit off of there, but we'll make some notes. I'm just going to see what we can do as far as pulling it tight. So the inside corner lines up, and we open up just a little bit here. So what we need to do is go through and just make a few notes and decide, do we want to come in here and clean up a little bit, take a little bit of this off in order to tighten that up, or... We'd be better off if we went over here and just took a little bit. I used my pencil. We just took a little bit off of this one and this one, just enough to close this gap. And then we don't have to mess with these. It's close enough that it'll still work for us. All right. I think what I'll do is go in, take it apart, and I'll take just a little bit off of there. It means we got to go through and do this all again, but we want it perfect. It takes a little bit of time. Okay, so we want to take just a sliver off of there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a shim. 
Uh, that's 26 thou. Just gonna see how much of a gap that produces. I think one, two, three passes. So that goes there. Do the same thing on this one. One, two, three. Now, without putting it back together, let's see if we can just get some idea what it looks like. Ah, I moved it. Okay, so we got to take a little off of this. I'm going to take a little bit less. Bit of trial and error on this stuff. Two passes. All right, I'm gonna put the clamps all back on and then we'll dry fit it one more time before we actually glue it. Okay, make sure these are nice and flat. Okay, oh, we're still a bit of a gap over here. I wonder if it could be from our clamping pressure too. The farther in, the more, this is, uh, doesn't make sense, but if that's the center line of your, of your uh, miter, then you should really line your clamps up, kind of looking at where that center of that clamp is with that line. If you're this side, you're gonna pull it open, and if you're this side, you're gonna pull it the opposite way. So I suspect that's the reason why we get a bit of a gap here, but we'll see what happens when we put some pressure on that. Let's see if it'll come in tight. That's perfect. Love it when that miter goes together like that. Part of the fun of woodworking is learn how to fix your mistakes. Not necessarily a mistake, but I didn't plane that inside edge like I told you. And if you try to do it now and you're resting that sharp point, which is part critical to a nice tight fit, you're gonna possibly damage it. So what I did is I've got a piece of plywood, cut a relief corner in there so that I could put that in and that tip is protected. And I can take my block plane because this is sitting up, this edge is sitting up off of the table. It will catch the blade and I can use this almost like a shooting board and just go in running my hand directly across. Now, I felt a little area right there where there's a little bump. So I'm gonna do another one. Okay, that's nice and clean. So I'll do two passes on each one. You may have read about uh, people talking about sizing the joint, which what they mean is you can take glue like this and mix it with a bit of water and go in there and brush it on or apply it to that, the two surfaces, let it dry, and it supposedly helps strengthen the joint by reducing the amount that the joint actually sucks in. I'm not gonna bother with it because we're gonna get a strong enough joint the way we do it, and we're going to strengthen this with a spline so it's it'll be, uh, plenty strong. So I'm only going to do one side. I'm going to put a fairly generous coat. Don't want too much running into that rabbit. Simply because if we do, we'll have to remove it. I've put wax paper underneath all the joints. I'm lining up that inside corner. Holding it flat. Now I can't pull too tight just yet because I, I didn't put a ton of pressure on that clamp because I don't want to damage the inside face.
Make sure that inside corner is and our last one. Okay, so now that we've got pressure on all of them, we can go back and just add a little bit more. Just a quick check to make sure they're fairly close to being flush so we don't have to remove a ton of material. They are. Okay, that's got to set for a little bit. When we're done, we'll go ahead and do the work to apply the spline. So this has been in the clamp for about 30, 45 minutes, somewhere in there. So my next move, up against a bench dog, actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it between bench dogs so I can hold it a little more securely. And I'm gonna use my block plane. I don't wanna put any bad dents in there, but I just wanna flush up these joint faces so that in the next step, we can uh, get a little more accurate. I'll show you what I mean. Advance that a little bit. Doesn't have to be perfect, just close. Mostly get rid of any glue squeeze out that's hardened. Okay, that's good. <clears throat> okay, this is really simple. First thing I'm gonna do, I'm going to use this a real simple jig. All it is is a piece of MDF with uh, two pieces of plywood on here cut to support the blade, uh, the, the uh, piece, work piece as I pass over the blade. You can see that it's had several curves to cut through it. And I wanna cut a groove, uh, cut a groove through that I can put a spline into. So. I'm just gonna set my blade. I don't wanna cut into my rabbit, but I'd also like to get a really, as much material in there as possible, which will only make the joint stronger. Now to make this a little better, I'm gonna put my sleeve on, and if you haven't got one of these and you'd like to make one, we'll leave a link below. If you have a Beesmeyer style fence, this is good for a couple of reasons. Number one, it acts as a sacrificial fence, which allows you to bring your blade into it without wrecking your good fence, but I use it because it gives me a lot more height so I have a lot more reference surface. Now trying to match up a blade exactly to your spline material is almost impossible, so I don't even bother trying. So I'm using a uh, thin curve blade and I'm, a, I'm using eighth inch Baltic birch. It's not exactly eighth of an inch, that's why I say it's never gonna match up to your blade just the way you want. What I like about it is it's actual solid birch all the way through so it doesn't look bad when it's when it's uh, being planed up and visible on the side. Now, we'll get this set. I'm gonna have to do two passes. Just wanna have a rough idea as to where that's going to engage. I can't see. You know, it's close to being in the middle. So I'll lock that down. So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna reference off the same face on all three, that's why I cleaned that up. It's also why I cleaned up the corners so that I know that would sit down there perfectly. So I wanna keep it nice and tight against this jig so that when we have to move it over for the second cut that it'll be exactly the same on all four corners. <laughs> that up too soon. Now, check that and see. Need about 30 second more. We can go either way. I'm gonna go this to my right. Try that. Remember, the outside is gonna be what's pressed against the jig.
That's a little too tight. Not by much. Okay, that fits down to the bottom without, without uh, making these top flare too much. So I would say that that's a good fit. So now I'll go and do that same operation on all four corners. I want those splines to fit nicely on the bottom. So I'm just gonna go in here and shoot a nice square edge. Doesn't really matter which direction the plywood is running. At least it's not that important, I don't think. This happens to be one of the scraps I had that was wide enough. Okay, so we'll put this in place. Then trace around that. myself a little bit of extra. Now we'll cut four of those over on the band so I'll cut one and then trace it. I've cut some scraps, or I've cut some corners out of scrap MDF, and what I'm going to do with these is simply put one on either side. So when we clamp this, two clamps spread the pressure over a greater area, doesn't mark up the wood. All right, let's put this in the vise. Make sure this fits. Uh, you want a rubber mallet. You get the glue on there, and if you haven't got it in the perfect spot, it's hard to move. That one will go in. I need a rag to wash my wipe. My now this is a bit messy. If you put glue in the groove, even with a knife, it ends up all over the place. I think it's probably easier to spread it on the spline just get a nice even coat. Fingers make the best glue spreaders. Get a nice even coat because most of it's going to get wiped off when you insert it. That's just so I don't get glue all over. You almost have to make sure that you go right to the bottom. One move. So now we'll take two pieces of MDF. Make sure you don't have any glue on there accidentally. You don't want it getting stuck to the... Oh, no, you know what I didn't do? Is I didn't check the inside, but that's... 
Yeah, we should have checked the inside. I'll do that on the other ones before we do any more, just so that we have good clamping pressure. In fact, this is not perfectly flush. I'll see if I can do it by hand right now. Problem is that if it isn't, the uh, clamp is gonna put all the pressure on one side and none on the other. All right, that's better. Two clamps should be enough. There, now I'll go through and do that with all the others, but I've got to go in here first and clean this up so, like I said, we get even pressure once we apply that clamp. I right, took these out of the clamps so now we've got to flush them off. I already did two, but I'm going to take you over the table saw and show you a way of doing it with the table saw. Obviously you can do it with a hand saw, you can do it with a band saw, you can plane it. It's a lot of wood to remove. You want to clean it up with the hand plane, but to get rid of the bulk of it, I'll show you a little way of doing it, the table saw. So this edge is parallel to this edge, but not necessarily to the way these pieces are sticking out. So what I do, it's cut a piece of material that has parallel edges. It'll fit in between. And I'll adjust the rip fence. Now, I've already done this, but I'll uh, trim it a little bit further, show you. Set the rip fence so that the blade is gonna be cutting right along there. And that'll take care of that excess. If I want to trim the opposite side, until I've had a chance to come in and clean this up, I can do the same thing here. Just make sure it goes between, and you want to hold it securely. Now, we've got an edge that is cleaned up. Now we can use our slid or a miter gauge. Okay, back over to the bench. Now, I keep, like to keep that throat nice and tight just in case I deal with some posing grain. That's actually been nice. That's, that is flush, this isn't. So I'll just go up here and finish this off. Then I can go in and f go full length until I clean off all of the saw marks. And just to avoid any tear out at that end, I just kind of try to slide it off so you're doing kind of a slicing cut. And that uh, usually prevents, or helps to prevent, breaking fibers at the end. And I'm only worried about the ones on that plywood. Same thing, I'm, I'm sticking up above here. I'm flush there, so I'll clean this off first. Thank you. 
Okay. Okay, I'm going to start on the inside, and if you want a little bit of practice, I suggest you start on the inside. Now, I need a couple little blocks here just to avoid leaving any marks. Now, I don't want my blade out too far. Need a little wax on that. And that's, that's flush, as is that. So all I really want to do is just get rid of some of these bumps. So I'm going to start right here, following that slope of the, uh, of the miter. I actually should spin around and finish it the same way on the other end. If you want, you can actually come over here. That's a mark that came from the thickness planer. I don't know if I can get rid of that or not. Whenever you can't finish your pass, at least lift your plane off while in a forward motion and then you don't end up with a, a noticeable mark. Okay, if you leave it like that, then you're going to get a bit of a ridge there. But if you lift off in a forward motion, it'll leave it nice and clean. I'm going to go this way. Retract my blade. Now for the back side of a picture frame, that actually feels pretty good. I don't know how much extra work I would do with that, and I don't think I'd even bother sanding it. I would like to get rid of that mark if I can. That actually looks like a uh, yeah, an area where it was compressed as opposed to a snipe where it's dug in. So if I want to get rid of that, I can put some water on that and that'll raise that up and I'll probably be able to get rid of it. So I'll dampen it. Yeah, it's going to swell right back up. Now, I didn't heat up my iron, but I'll get my iron out, heat it up, put a cloth, a cloth over that, and I'll show you how we can just clean that off. Never know it was there. Okay, I got my iron on hot. That's soaked for probably 10 minutes. I just put a piece of white paper towel over it. This is mostly just to uh, dry it out because I think it's already raised up above the surface. What happened is the infeed roll, the board got stuck when it was going through the thickness planer and the infeed roller just sat in one spot and pressed down on it. I think that's what it was. Okay, now I'll take a pass over that and that should come off nice and clean.
Where was it? Can't tell. Okay, a little practice on the back. Now we're gonna go over and do the front. Okay, that's clean, that's clean. Little pen mark, pencil mark right there. But I still gotta get rid of this. Pull the blade in a little bit. Don't wanna feel any marks or plane tracks. One right there. Just a little more blade. Now you can do whatever you want in the edge. All I'm gonna do is just go in and break those edges just so it's not sharp to the touch. I'll just count and do the same number of passes. I use my thumb to help hold the angle. Okay, that's small enough. I'm not gonna do anything with those corners. Now, cut a piece of plexiglass. Now, just before you put it together, you just wanna make sure that there isn't any glue in the corners that's gonna prevent the uh, plexiglass or the glass from sitting in there properly. So I cut this to size. I like using the plexiglass just because it's easy to work with. The only problem is it scratches so easily, so you've gotta be really careful with it. Cut this to size. And I just use, you can use anything. I just make it nice and light. I just sheet of cardboard that I kept. Now, you can push some little push points in there or uh, finished nails, tiny ones, whatever you want. And then you can, of course, you can put a hanger on there as well, but just gives you a nice quick, well, relatively quick, but nice tight miters. You can see the spline, and in a future video, we'll do one where you don't see spline. We'll find, I'll show you some other ways of reinforcing the joint, but there you go. If you enjoy my method of work and like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. Now, I've always said, better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the icon with the plane and the chisel, it'll take you to our website, introduce you to all of our tools that we actually manufacture right here, as well as our workshops, both in person and online. Good luck.